Will the nation's highest court step in and overrule application of the 14th Amendment? I'm Greg Grugan, and welcome to Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Dr. Sergio Lira, president of LULAC Houston. Next up, well-known Houston attorney and conservative commentator, Gary Polland. In the three spot, Charles Blaine, founder of Blaine & Company, and most recently, a contributor to the Houston Chronicle. Batting cleanup, former Houston City Council member, Sue Lovell. And closing us out, Marcus Davis, highly regarded restaurateur and host of Fish, Grits, and Politics. Let's begin. There is much to do. I have no patience, no time to waste. The citizens he will govern, John Whitmire has officially taken command of Houston, Texas. After two years of systematically identifying what's wrong in the nation's fourth largest city, it is now his responsibility to fix what's broken, as in ramshackle streets and crumbling infrastructure, as in municipal finances perched perilously on a fiscal cliff, as in the badly battered sense of public integrity and fair play at City Hall, and finally, the disrupted sense of well-being inflicted on our population by years of pervasive, often violent crime. My number one priority and the priority of Houstonians is public safety. If we do not address public safety, the other quality of life issues will not matter. And so begins the leadership of 74-year-old John Whitmire, who after a half century in the Texas legislature, launched his administration by greeting face-to-face -face every single Houstonian who accepted his invitation to visit their city hall. Panel, what's your point? And I'm gonna start with you, Sue Lovell, because you've known John Whitmire, I think, the longest. A very long time, over 40 years. Okay, well, let's talk about you know, the fundamentals here. What can he get done? Because it's progress, not perfection, right? Right. Well, first, he, he campaigned and he laid out what it was he was going to do. Uh, in his inaugural speech, he laid out what he was going to do, and the next day, he started doing it. I mean, he met with the firefighters to, uh, to put, put that in motion. The day after that, he met with law enforcement to put, you know, to put that in motion. He's um, Houston first. He's already, we have a new, new leadership there, a new finance director. So he's systematically moving through and keeping his promises. I do think they're gonna find out the city really financially is in a lot worse condition than they thought it's gonna be, but those are things they're gonna to have to discover. So he's keeping his promises and moving forward. All right, Sergio, uh, new year, new sense of hope. <laughs> are you optimistic about this mayor? Oh, absolutely. I, I, you know, his, he's absolutely correct in terms of public safety. I appreciate that he's not only focusing on the quantitative data, but the qualitative data. And that is how people feel and believe about public safety. You know, your average neighbor across the street, now he doesn't you know, talk to you in the morning and say, hey, have you read the latest gr uh, crime stats? They want to know what happened, who was robbed, who was killed in our neighborhood. But also, let's put it in context, he's absolutely right. One year of data point from crime statistics doesn't uh, give the whole picture in terms of what that, uh, let's put it in context, is that one year before COVID, after COVID, is it progress? Let's look at a three to five year longitudinal study, and we know that data can be inflated or deflated and, look and get the desired outcome that we want. I'll give you an example in overtime. All right, Marcus Davis, if there's anything I've learned about you, it's trust, but verify, verify, verify. Right. What would you like to see this mayor do in his first six months? Well, I've, I've maintained that Houston is a city that is full of potential. And I've also been consistent by saying I'm looking for leadership that can take Houston to the level that it deserves to be in. So I hope and expect to see those wheels put in motion. Yes, public safety is important. There's some other things that are also equally as important. To the uh, mayor's point, uh, those other things are second to public, public safety because if we don't attract business here, then we're not being fruitful to the city. But if we don't keep Houston safe, then attracting business here is a whole nother story. So I'm, I'm anxious and excited to see uh, what he does in his leadership in the first six months. Gary Polland, uh, John Whitmire, 
pledged to unify the city. And this is supposed to be a nonpartisan position, but he drew support from both the left and the right uh, to prevail here. What are you hoping to see from this mayor? I think uh, keep his promises. I think he outlined what his agenda was. I think the agenda, I think first thing we need to talk about the agenda, understand he did not inherit a warm bed. I mean, he, tr Sylvester Turner handed him basically a bag of garbage. Okay, not picked up by the way, because Whitmer had a problem with garbage pickup this week. Uh, it's not a good situation. It is a challenge, but I think he's up to it, and I think he's going to do a really good job to the extent he has the resources. And Sue pointed out correctly, the fiscal crisis is still there. It hadn't gone away, even though Turner told us we had all this money. We don't, and that's going to be a challenge. And he's going to have to start taking on some sacred cows, like the Terzas and other sacred cows, where there's money available to the city. Metro being another example to be used to deal with the core issues that he's talked about. All right, Charles Blaine, it's a photo finish between you and Sue to, to uh, try to decide who watches council and city government closest. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to give you the same question I gave to Marcus. What would you like to see happen in the first six months? Um, I mean, public safety, certainly. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot of talk about that over the past few years, so I'd like to see kind of what success looks like for this administration, what they define success to be. I think Sergio's right, and a longitudinal study would be great and expensive, but we should look at that to kind of figure out which way we're trending, because facts aren't feelings. People might feel one way, but we need to know what the facts are about public safety in the city. And then at the same time, he's got six months to deliver a budget to city council, and so I'm really curious to see what comes in that first budget. Uh, we know that the last budget, public say, uh, policing was over a billion dollars. Is it going to go higher? Is it going to stay the same? Is it going to be reprioritized? What does that look like? Um, and so that's what I'm looking at is, you know, facts or, or data in terms of public safety, what the first budget looks like, if we can get some ethics reform, because we certainly need that at City Hall. Um, and then, of course, what council ends up taking shape to look, to look like, council committees, whose chairs, things like that. So what does it say to you, surprise question, that he has decided to retain Chief Troy Fenner? Um, I mean, it, it says that he has faith in what he's done and that he feels as though under his administration he could probably do better. And so I think that we've got to give him an opportunity to do that. That's his choice. And so, you know, it's, it, it always comes down to leadership. And so the previous mayor oversaw Troy Finner, and so we, we saw the extent of what he was able to do under Mayor Turner. And so maybe now, if you know, taking the handcuffs off, for a lack of a better phrase, see what um, he can do under, under Mayor Whitmire. It also looks, Sue, as if Arturo Michelle, the city attorney, will be ha staying around at least for a while. Why? Well, you know, you can't just let everybody go, first of all. Second, what you need is someone that has some sort of historical knowledge, and Arturo certainly does have that, plus some people on his staff that can guide him and tell him about things in the past, how you move forward. So it, 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 I don't think it's an unusual move. I thought it was a good move for that stability to keep Arturo there and his staff uh, as he moves forward and we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, we're going to keep an eye on it. You can bet on it. <laughs> Still to come, chaos on the border continues with a record number of illegal crossers defying the law and the Biden administration doing little to stop the influx. And in our Sunday survey, we are asking viewers if this, they support or oppose sending migrants to northern cities on buses funded by Texas taxpayers. Tell us what you think. Vote on our webpage, fox26houston.com. Just click on the poll at the top of the page or tell 26 using our news app. But up next, the city of Houston's mistreatment of its firefighters appears to be finally finished. Question now, can the mayor negotiate an affordable price for peace? I will meet with the farmer tomorrow to begin negotiations to get them and the city out of court. It can be done. It must be done. You do not sue your first responders in John Whitmire's administration. And less than 24 hours later, Houston's mayor began making good on his word, ordering the city to abandon all pending litigation against its long-suffering first responders. Those of you who watch this program know exactly who is to blame for seven years of labor contract impasse and millions of taxpayer dollars wasted on a doomed, vindictive legal fight. Former Mayor Sylvester Turner has left his successor and those very same taxpayers a gigantic balloon note, which some say could approach a billion dollars for back pay owed and benefits neither negotiated nor delivered. That said, Union President Marty Langton appears highly confident a just and fair outcome is finally heading firefighters' way.
We're looking forward to working with Mayor Whitmire hand in hand in collaboration and fixing these problems. They're going to get fixed. It takes real solutions. It takes real people sitting down and it takes uh, people's willingness to find a solution. Panel, while it's not going to be cheap, I think we can all agree it has to be done. You agree, Charles? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, at, at some point it has to be done. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the Greater Houston Partnership in their report topped it out at what they expect to be $600 million or something. So I guess we'll see. Um, ultimately, taxpayers are the ones paying for this. And so we need to, what's going to be in the best interest of both the firefighters, but the taxpayers, because they're the ones shouldering this burden. And so um, it should have been done a long time ago. It's, it's nice to see that they're sitting down now. Um, but I'm going to hold my breath until we finally see a final resolution, because we've We've had conversations about what could happen, what might happen, but we haven't gotten there yet. And so until we do, you know, hold my breath. All right, so you've been involved in some of these discussions, so you got to give us some insight. What's going to happen here? <laughs> they're going to sit down and they're going to, you know, come to an agreement on a contract. And what wasn't mentioned was that his very last, when his very last acts as mayor, Sylvester Turner directed his legal department to file an appeal, yet again, to continue the fight. He couldn't just walk away and let it be so the, all, all that's been thrown out now they're going to sit down they're going to come to some some agreeable solution um, for a contract and move forward all right we have a lawyer on the panel uh gary you know as you look back at the seven or eight years of litigation what's your assessment our court systems move slowly <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was a, a total waste of time and money from both sides because the firemen had to pay their lawyers to contest it the city had to spend money on it and we didn't solve the problem what we did which a lot of things that Turner did he just punted he's punted everything he wanted to hold it till the end he would not make a deal on his watch when it was clear when the Supreme Court ruled it was over and he could have gone to the table and made a deal mm -hmm refused to do it, which I think is an indictment as part of his legacy. There ought to be a book about all the things he screwed up as mayor. That's the book that should have been published, not his book he put out about all the great things he did. All right, I got 30 seconds. Who wants it? No, I, I, I just want to say that I, I, <laughs> I like that the mayor immediately told the city attorney after the Michelle to take that, uh, stop that appeal, remove the repeal, and that the, the firefighters, Marty Lampton, and all these folks are finally going to be able to sit down and negotiate, and hopefully there's an incremental uh, payback for the firemen, well-deserved, but also not have a negative impact on the other important departments. Yeah, Marty claims we're five or 600 firefighters short. We'll cool. Follow that as well. Yes. When we come back, we're looking at the new city council elected to join John Whitmire in making Houston, Texas a better place to live. Welcome back. Joining Houston's new mayor in leadership is a newly congregated city council, a council that's more conservative, more Latino, and more female than its predecessor. We enjoy serving with the men on council, but when there is a supermajority of women on Houston City Council, we are making a statement that women are here to serve and to lead. Panel, this city council will also be more empowered than the body which preceded it, given the recently approved charter amendment allowing three members in agreement to place any item on the agenda for consideration and authority which rested solely with the mayor in the past. Way to go, Charles Blaine, on that, so you get the first go here. Uh, and, uh, no, no, there was not enough enthusiasm during the break. Okay, uh, but my take on it, I, well, I'm excited that that uh, council is excited, and I'm hoping that, you know, they take this opportunity to really push forward some good stuff. I've been talking to some new council members and looking at things from Sunset Review to Ethics Reform, and so it would be really nice to see them take a lead and actually push them forward and um, not, just, not just kind of sitting idly by, as we've seen in years past. And so I'm really pumped. I'm, I'm excited for this council and excited for the returning members and for the new members. Yeah, you partnered with the firefighters some on, on that, that charter yep. amendment, right? Yeah. Marcus, what do you make of this new group of Houstonians leading us? Uh, I don't. I'm waiting to see. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm excited about it. It's a great opportunity to show um, the, the diversity of Houston. It's a great opportunity to show the opportunity for diversity and leadership in, in Houston. And, you know, this is where the, where the rubber meets the road. 
Uh, we talked about the, the problems that John Whitmire has, has inherited and the opportunity to, to correct those. But this interesting, this new dynamic with the Charles Blaine ordinance <laughs> is, you know, it, it, well, because for years, everyone has loosely and tightly and probably correctly used the, the, the phrase uh, strong male form of government. Well, this is supposed to curb that and give uh, the people who represent the, the, the citizens of Houston an opportunity to have their voice heard as they represent the citizens of Houston. So, uh, you know, it's a, the interesting dynamic here, you know, how often they will use it, the ways in which they will use it, the ways in which the mayor will respond to them using it. So the Charles Blowing Ordinance is going to be, you know, the driving force in Houston moving forward. <laughs> Sergio, if council exactly reflected Houston's population, there'd be seven, maybe eight Latinos. You move from one to three, that's... That's, that's a pretty good record, but not where you want to be. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, I, I appreciate all the women in, in positions now, and uh, however, uh, you can see that there's not a single Latina on city council, and also good men are not, being, are not obsolete in the political arena. So, uh, but however, the, the amendment uh, to allow three council members on uh, to put an agenda item for consideration is a good thing. It's going to provide for democracy, some robust discussion. Uh, you want to see a different tone at City Council this time. So I, I, I like what I see, but we can do much better, and hopefully uh, we have some Latina City Council members. As I mentioned in the lead-in, Gary, uh, this council is more conservative, representing maybe a tack back to the middle and perhaps more representative of the city as a whole? I think so, and I think that uh, a diverse council is a good thing. I think the, the three votes of council members to take up subjects is a good idea if used constructively. If you look around the country, there are instances where, where council members can put stuff on the agenda and they put the stuff on what our foreign policy should be, what our immigration policy should be, things that are not of concern to the city council. So I want to make sure that they use it in a way to focus on the challenges that Houston faces, which are significant. And that'll be a plus. And I think that uh, Mayor Whitmire is going to be open to hearing ideas from council. I mean, one of the things I've found over the last eight years I thought that the council was pretty much muted. I don't think they said much about anything. The only thing I heard from council people I was friendly with who were by district was if you countered the mayor, he was going to screw your district. So I guess that's how Sylvester Turner rolled. Former Mayor Pro Tem, correct? Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Vice Mayor Pro Tem. One word of advice to the new council. Um, listen. Listen, listen to your constituents. All right, we're going to leave it there. Up next, six years after Hurricane Harvey unloaded on southeast Texas, the state alleges city bureaucrats under Sylvester Turner neglected to get millions in federal aid to deserving victims. I was always given the runaround, and I was always treated very, spoken to very rudely or almost always dismissed by the city officials like I was some kind of burden. They're very not interested in providing these funds, and I wasn't really sure why. That's Harvey survivor Pratchett Bott describing his frustrating struggle to access federally funded relocation dollars through the city of Houston. Bott was among nearly a, a thousand Houstonians evicted from their homes when the city bought four flood-prone complexes, again with federal money. Now, more than six years after the storm, the Texas General Land Office says only 15% of the residents eligible for substantial relocation cash actually received any aid via the city. Land Commissioner Don Buckingham told Fox 26 she is shocked by the city of Houston's failure to comply with federal law. Panel, the GLO is now hoping to contact residents directly who've been shortchanged and distribute some of the $200 million uh, federal relief dollars the city has yet to access. Uh, okay, let's start with you, Sue. Uh, you, you've talked to the GLO. Uh, what happened here? Well, the monies didn't get distributed. In, in order to distribute money to a lot of people, you have to really bring more people on to make sure that money gets distributed. If you're dislocated and you have to move, you have to go do that quickly or else you become homeless. And so the problem was they were going like this gentleman to go get the money 
but they were having a, a difficult problem getting the paperwork through and all the people that came over, there just weren't enough people to handle them. I mean, I think we have to start now, forget about talking about the past. We have a new day, new leadership, a new land commissioner, a new mayor that have a good working relationship with each other and figure out how we now move forward and, and fix these problems and be able to communicate and move these problems forward in the way that they should have been. Marcus, you're skeptical of the GLO's finger pointing. Well, I, I, listen, let's, let's start with this. I'm excited that the citizens of Houston will now get the relief. I happen to have uh, personal friends, customers who were actually impacted by the lack of allocation of funds uh, in the city and on, on, on the state level. So I'm excited that this opportunity will, will be there. But I, 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 yes, I do ha have to say that the, 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 I'm glad that the GLO ha is attempting to change because this is the same GLO that had about $2 billion sent back to the federal government because they didn't apply for the, in 2022, that they, di they didn't do the paperwork to get the money for Harvard money. Then again in 21, where they did, they, <coughs> allocated zero dollars <coughs> to Harris County, to the city of Houston, from federal federal dollars for Harvey Relief. Zero. Meanwhile, putting money into non-coastal cities. So there's a history in that office of being partisan and not being effective. So I'm glad that right now there's a change in leadership and there's a hopefully a change in direction. Charles, let's distinguish between George P. Bush, the <laughs> former land commissioner, and Don Buckingham, who had a close relationship with John Whitmire as they served in the Senate. That could potentially be constructive? No, certainly, and I think that's what the mayor ran on, was his, his relationships at the state level, but I do think there is some political gamesmanship going on on both sides here, because if they didn't comply with federal law, we've seen the federal government come down on the on previous administration when it came to the Fountain View housing project, the CDBG dollars, things like that, so if they didn't comply, then why didn't the federal government say something? Hmm. So if the GLO uh, commissioner is saying that, then I'd like to know where, where that is, and then the same thing is if they found these families, or, they, or they're searching for these families who didn't get the money why are they just doing it now? I mean, it's on the city. The city should have done that, obviously, if the GLO is saying that they didn't. But if they felt they weren't doing it, why are they just doing it now? Shouldn't this have been done prior? You know, when that $140 million was clawed back from the city, I think it was last February when the administration met with the GLO. If they knew that was an issue, then why is it just happening <laughs> now? I guess. And to Gary's point earlier, where was council on this? These people have city council representatives. That should, they, this should not be a search. This should not have been hard to find. These district rep representatives should know that, yeah, you get where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we had people who were paid to get this yeah. money to these victims right. six and a half years later, and it's still sitting in the bank. It's That's shameful. what's wrong. Yeah, okay, shameful. still ahead, three years into the Biden presidency, and the number of immigrants crossing our border has never been worse. The latest controversial developments are up for discussion when we come back. Because Joe Biden and, and the Democrats refuse to secure the border, Texas has and we will uh, continue to erect barriers, uh, repel migrants, as well as uh, bus and fly migrants to New York, Chicago, and other places like that. Governor Greg Abbott defiant after the Department of Justice filed legal action to block the Lone Star State's new law authorizing Texas peace officers to arrest immigrants here illegally. The DOJ lawsuit comes after a record 302,000 uninvited foreign nationals were apprehended in December alone. Panel seems like Texas can make a solid case by simply stating the feds clearly aren't enforcing our nation's law and preventing us from doing the job only compounds the damage inflicted by the president's abdication and negligence. A little editorial on mm. my part there, said he opened. I mean, you know, <coughs> come on, 302,000 people. Well, you know, December is the traveling month. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> For, with okay. Fly, fly on, bus, yeah. walk, whatever. Oh However, it, it does. The it it does. Do. <laughs> the, 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 no, and, <laughs> seriously. And 302,000 they did. I was looking at the data. 220,000 were detained in custody by um, uh, Border Patrol agents. And out of those 220,000, we have to look at how many were arrested on felony charges that are in overcrowded jails and prison, how many were expelled back. But also, this. let's flip the script. You know, besides 
raised the Senate Bill 4 racial profiling issue, but, but you know, this argument about open borders, let's flip the script. Actually, the Border Patrol is doing a great job. They apprehended 302,000 <laughs> migrants. That means they're doing their job. I commend them. But also keep in mind that the Biden administration sent back, deported, 11 airplanes full of Venezolanos, Venezuelans back to Caracas, Venezuela, and that never gets the news. But let's just put it all in context. They're doing a great job, and of course, it's out of control, but we can do much better. <laughs> Marcus, <laughs> Sandio says they're doing a great job, are they? <laughs> Listen, um, the, uh, the federal government is doing a terrible job at handling this crisis, and it is jeopardizing uh, the future and the current state of, of the United States of America. And it's so unfortunate that, you know, you, they have the energy to go and sue uh, the state of Texas for the policy that they put in place, but they don't have the energy to put a policy in place that's effective for citizens of Houston and effective for people who want to come here uh, legally. So it's, it's, it's so unfortunate. And, you know, the Iceman, I, I don't side with him often, but sending, sending uh, the buses and a message to the, 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 the democratic cities that are not listening is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's chess. And now that, and, and unfortunately the, the mayor of, 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 of New York is insane because now he's <laughs> suing the bus company That's for their uh, participation in it instead of using that energy to correct and curb the problem. The Iceman cometh. <laughs> All right, our Sunday survey agrees with Marcus. 90% uh, of our viewers right now support the idea of busing immigrants uh, to northern and western cities. Charles, uh, I support the idea based on it getting the result, letting them feel the pain that Houston is feeling, that Eagle Pass and other counties and cities are feeling. Yeah, Eric Adams says the uh, immigrant influx is destroying the city of New York. His words, not mine, former resident of New Jersey. Yes, and I lived in, I lived in Brooklyn for two years. I mean, it is, and the reason is, and Sergio, 11 airplanes leave Hobby Airport an hour. That is, that's nothing. Um, but like how does Charles <laughs> know all of this stuff? No, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But it wasn't you, a private jet, when you it was a at, huge when, you, when you look at, um, at New York, I, I can understand why he says it's destroying it, because they have a constitutional amendment that says they have to house anyone who's unhoused. So when they go there, and he sued the state of New York trying to to overturn that and they said no they reinforced it <laughs> and so it is difficult but these are also the same mayors who sat there idly by for years letting this issue happen and then chastising the state of Texas New Mexico Arizona Florida other places when they didn't when they couldn't de deal with this burden and so what Abbott's doing is working because now you see people uh, the mayor of Chicago the mayor of LA led a delegation of mayors to the uh, White House to go speak with the president about doing something I don't know what came of that but Not you're great. seeing some change that comes out or or you're seeing some change in rhetoric that's coming out of it. So we'll see if that actually leads to change in policy. I mean, I doubt it, but we'll see. Gary, do you think that all of this is coalescing into an openness for some type of immigration reform on a bipartisan basis? Uh, no. No? I don't think that's happening. What I do think is coalescing is that the American people are finally realizing what a giant scam our open borders are and how it impacts Americans and residents here. It, it impacts our education, welfare system, health care, everything, crime, everything. And it's going to be a major issue in this election. And if this is a major issue, as I think it will be, I think that Joe Biden is going to get beat because he deserves to go. He is not enforcing our laws at all. We have an open border. I mean, we were talking before the show. We have been talking about this for five years, six <laughs> years. We've been talking about it forever. And things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. And this idea, Sergio, <laughs> that the, the federal government is enforcing our immigration law, no! How they're an escort you? service. They <laughs> escort these people into the country, they process <laughs> them, and they give them a court date in five years and say, hey, please show up. <laughs> okay, guess what? We're going to talk about it in the next segment, too. <laughs> Still to come, banned at least temporarily from the ballot in Maine and Colorado. Can Donald Trump convince the Supreme Court the 14th Amendment sanction against insurrectionists simply doesn't apply to him? But up next, the state of Texas shipping more and more immigrants north and west to so-called sanctuary cities as Governor Greg Abbott continues to make our problem their problem. One thing is absolutely clear. America is at a breaking point with record levels of illegal immigration. 
House Speaker Mike Johnson on the troubled border near Eagle Pass, along with 60 fellow members of Congress getting a firsthand assessment of the crisis. Meantime, as more Texas buses loaded with New York bound immigrants arrive in New Jersey, the outcry and the acrimony continued. This is a mean spirited way of using people and disrupting uh, municipalities, uh, not only in this region and in other parts of the entire, in the, in the entire country. Panel, I don't know about you, but it seems Mayor Adams is asking Texas to somehow hold these undocumented immigrants captive and not help them travel to self-proclaimed sanctuary cities. You agree with that assessment, Sergio? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Mayor of New York is a big whiner because we're not hearing the big, <laughs> we're not hearing the same arguments. <laughs> you know, you know, from the mayor of Los Angeles, the mayor of New Jersey, the mayor of Chicago, uh, we're not hearing the same arguments. And besides, you know, uh, these folks are not anticipating that that immigrants are going to come into their city and they need to prepare for that. And I, I appreciate Greg Abbott's modern day freedom riders. If you made it through the hell to get up to the border and from Texas, it's a beautiful trip to go to New York. All right, Sue, bring some, uh, br 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 bring, bring some insight. You did say whiner, right? You said whiner. whiner. Okay, I was making, you said insane. <laughs> I was so, being nice. Sue Lovell, bring some wisdom to this situation. Oh, golly. That's a heavy lift. <laughs> The, well, it's obvious that it's just chaos down there, and they should step in. I mean, I like the old Ellis Island model, which, you know, my relatives came through. You know, it, it, was, it was organized, it was orderly. You had somebody here sponsoring you. There was a job waiting for you. So, you know, cities were able to plan. Here's the whole thing. Cities that have influx, like Houston, we plan. I mean, we can plan that we have to build more schools, more houses, how do we plan infrastructure? This, you can't plan for this. And that's what's hurting our cities is just the amount of people that are pouring in uh, into the cities and the cost to that, but just the lack of, of planning to be able to, to um, absorb all these people. The federal government does, but the Speaker of the House, who is federal government, I didn't see him coming up with any solutions as no, he stood at the border. True. Okay, well, look, I've got to talk okay. about the abdication of Congress from their responsibility. We have dual uh, finger pointing saying it's their fault. No, it's their fault. You do it well, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and they do it well. You know, they, they, they are a BS machine and they produce it on a regular basis. And this is why we can't get uh, the solution that we need. Meanwhile, uh, the nation is hurting. Uh, the country is hurting from not solving this problem. This country is hurting uh, from the lack of leadership to solve this problem. The country is hurting from the partisan politics that is the roadblock to solving this problem. And we, we and I, I won't overlook the the, the in, inhumane, the inhumanity that's that's involved in it. We've got to fix this, and it, it because it's a big distraction and it's deteriorating our country. We're going to give Gary a chance later. Okay. Up next, three years after the ransacking of America's capital. Donald Trump's role in the riot threatens to wreck his bid for re-election. Mr. Trump engaged in insurrection and therefore was disqualified. Maine Secretary of State announcing her decision to bar former President Donald Trump from that state's presidential ballot, citing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Maine joined Colorado in excluding the Republican frontrunner, despite the fact that Trump has not and may not uh, be convicted of crimes related to the January 6th Capitol riot panel. Both decisions have been appealed, and it's likely the U.S. Supreme Court will be compelled to settle the issue. Uh, okay, lawyer, what's going on here? Uh, the problem is he's never been charged with insurrection, okay? If he'd been charged and convicted of insurrection, I think they'd be right, but he, they weren't. So the Supreme Court's already voted. They, they did on late Friday. They're going to hear the case, and I think it'll be 7-2 or 9-0 to flush it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, what's interesting about all, all these attacks on Trump, uh, all the card cases, uh, what is it, zillions of indictments, whatever, his numbers go up every time this happens. It's almost like the left in the country really wants Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. Oh, the right in the country is just lacking the testicular fortitude to do the right thing 
or the brains to do the right well, thing. If, one, if, one of the if two, if not, the if, polling, not, if not both. If you look at the polling. Because <clears throat> you got to think about what you just said. Every time this happens, his numbers go up. That's yes, correct. the Democrats are doing dumb, dumb stuff, but the poll numbers aren't going up by the Democrats. They're going up by people who are oh. actually supporting this predator, That's this criminal, this <laughs> buffoon, this narcissistic turd, exactly. this whiner. <laughs> the reason that they're what supporting him, though, is because they, the I'm Democrats fair. are Hold making on. him look like a martyr. They exactly. keep doing this, and they're making him look like a martyr, so his numbers go up, because it pushes some Republicans even further into his corner. Exactly. I mean, they didn't charge him with ins an insurrection. Whether or not you feel he did it, they didn't yeah. charge him with that. So then to pursue this, it's when we know it's not going to go anywhere because of the way the Supreme Court sacked anyway, it just doesn't make any sense. And then it puts us in a position of becoming like a banana republic, because now you have lieutenant governor saying we should remove Biden from the Texas ballot, and then we have other governors saying we should move this person, that person. We're opening up a floodgate that we can't close. Yeah, oh, and by people. the way, we're also distracting uh, the public <clears throat> from the real issues we face. True. That's the biggest problem. So Trivia for Charles Blaine. <laughs> I <laughs> bet you don't know where Banana Republic came from. I don't. Okay, and you had something to say <laughs> on the border. Uh, yeah, I'm sick and tired of them going down to the border in their tactical vests for photo <laughs> shoots on a pontoon boat looking out into the sunset <laughs> to sit there and say that they're doing something when they don't do anything. We, This country was developed based on a revolution, and they were able to build a country based on nothing. And we can't solve a problem as simple as the borders because they don't want to solve it, and that's the reason. You have 30 seconds. I know. The, and the border problem starts with the administration, which refuses to enforce the law. And my friend Sergio uh, talking about them doing their job is a joke because they're basically uh, immigration and the, and, the, and the border police are escort services, okay? And the state of Texas, to some extent, is doing the same because we're escorting them to other cities. So we're the travel, other thing of interest this week I had to mention, <laughs> the left-wing media in the country is now talking about immigrants from Texas not illegal immigrants into the country. So now they want to send the elite Texas immigrants back to Texas. They want to give us the problem. No thanks, I Mayor. just want to say our taxpayers are paying for this export services. Okay, we're going to talk more <laughs> later when we come back. With just three weeks remaining before the New Hampshire primary, Nikki Haley appears to be mounting a challenge, maybe not significant, but a challenge in the Granite State. We know the Civil War was about slavery, but it was also more than that. It was about the freedoms of every individual. Not sure what that means. Uh, Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley walking back a troubling blunder on the primary campaign trail when she neglected to mention mass human bondage when discussing the causes of the Civil War. That said, the former South Carolina governor is making some headway in the early primary state of New Hampshire, where she trails former President Trump by just four points, with three more weeks left to potentially gain more ground against voters uh, before voters cast ballots. Now, panel, what should we make of this development, if anything? I'll go to you, Charles. Yeah, I love that she says it was more than about more than slavery. I don't know what more it could be. Freedom, freedom to what? Own slaves? The reason that Nikki Haley's never going to be president is because she's inauthentic. And this this proves it. She goes out there and says this because she knows Southern primaries are coming up and there's a certain section of Republican primary voters in the South who believe the Civil War was not about slavery. So she goes and says that. But this is the same person who, as governor, was removing Confederate statues because of what they represented. So this is why Nikki Haley's not going to be president. And it's also because she's a the, the brain child of, you know, Raytheon and, and Lockheed Martin, and she's going to take us to war if she is president. So. Who is authentic these days in, 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 in politics? In politics. I Who mean, is authentic? Trump, as much as we want to criticize oh him, God. is he not oh who he is? God. Is he not who he is? No. He no, tells so you who he is. Becomes he's a chameleon. Like him or not, he tells no. you who he is and what he believes. Go ahead, no, Gary. He's a big uh, he's authentically I don't, inauthentic. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't agree with Charles. I, I think that what happened here was, first, the first question is, what does the Civil War have to do with the presidential race in 2024? Well, Short answer, you should know nothing. What, that, okay. okay. The, the other thing that happened here, Charles, I think that happened, sometimes you get a question, and this happens to us on the panel, and you're, you, you're looking, for that, looking for a word to say, and you don't, it just doesn't come for you. It has happened to all of us. That's number two. Are you excusing her behavior? Uh, it's, well, it's, critical race if, theory. If, if I had never done anything <laughs> stupid or had a, a, a brain issue that I didn't remember something, I wouldn't 
criticize it, but I have, and so have all of us. So she is an alternative. She's not perfect. None of these candidates are perfect. She polls better against Biden because of the coalition you've talked about. I think she's going to do better in, in Iowa. I think she's going to do. I think she's going to win New Hampshire, and I think then the race is on. As far as her being part of the warmonger neocon uh, in the country, hey, wake up! We're already at war. You know, we, we don't have, have to be. No, we are. We're, we're, we don't we're have war to be. with the Houthis. We haven't recognized it, so we pinprick and don't do what we need to do. But there can be a whole debate about uh, peace through strength, which I think this country needs to get back to. <laughs> Honest question: uh, Do you think? Who do you think that, that Joe Biden would rather run against, Donald Trump or Nikki Haley? Uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Sue? Sue? Donald Trump, he already ran against him. Yeah, he, he really him. beat him once. He yeah. gets all these indictments and all this stuff. And he's, he's still hiding under the, bed, under the bed for any type of debate, so he's the guy to beat. Uh, he doesn't want to run against Nimarada. Okay, we'll leave there it there. <laughs> Welcome back. This week, Claudine Gay, Harvard University's first black president, tendered her resignation following six tumultuous months leading the institution. Gay was among a trio of university presidents criticized for their congressional testimony regarding anti-Semitism on college campuses. Responses many viewed as tepid and ambiguous. Additional controversy erupted soon after when Gay was accused of plagiarism <coughs> as critics highlighted duplicative language in her published papers. This week in the New York Times, Gay denied lifting the work of other scholars, but acknowledged that she, quote, neglected to clearly articulate that calls for the genocide of Jewish people are abhorrent and unacceptable, end quote. Panel gays defenders say she was unjustly targeted by conservative activists in attacking uh, an, an attack that they say reeked of racism. Uh, Charles, you've looked at this. What's your take? Um, do I, I don't think it was based on race. I think she was targeted because of her perspective on Israel when she was testifying, because she had been president of Harvard prior to that, and no one cared to look at any of the work that she had done before she went to Congress and testified. So I think that is why she was targeted. Um, and then the board tried to stand with her, but ultimately she didn't, she lost the, the presidency, but she's still in Harvard and she's still making the same salary. And so that didn't really change. But I'll also say her biggest uh, opponent, Bill Ackman, his wife then found, they found out that she played that's yesterday, right. we were talking about oh that. God. So it's like, oh, it's that doesn't make it okay. <laughs> not, not speaking well no, for MIT. Uh, academia right now. <laughs> Look, here, here's the bottom line. This wasn't racism. The president of Stanford got run because of academic fraud. They ran the president of University of Pennsylvania because of the not recognizing the genocide is a bad thing. Uh, so it's happened in both instances. Uh, Gay, her problem was... She's involved in academic fraud and has been. It was covered up, I guess. You know, if you're a student at Harvard and you engage in the conduct she did, you would be kicked out of Harvard never to return. Instead, she gets a golden parachute, makes 900000 a year. So it sounds to me like she got a really good deal and shouldn't be whining. And, of course, I am so tired of the race card being applied or, or thrown out there when it doesn't apply. Because we do have racism in the country, and it should be called who, out when it happens. Who applied the race card? But Dr. Gay. No, uh, who applied the race card? She did. Yeah. She played the race card. We did. She and her allies have said that this is the reason they came after me is because I'm black. We gotta go. I, We're gonna I, continue I, this in oh, overtime. No, we can't go. <laughs> well, we go. Let's continue in an yeah. overtime. Thanks to this week's panel and Big thank you for joining us. Like, the conversation like continues like on a national you. level next on Fox yeah. News Sunday yeah. with Shannon Bream. And we'll keep talking here with What's Your Point Overtime streaming live on fox26houston.com and on our Facebook page. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.